the push from the European Commission for market integration across uh, the border has produced very good results actually in Bulgaria. First with the establishment of the National Independent Energy Exchange, which is now part of the Bulgarian Stock Exchange. And in turn, the independent power exchange played an instrumental role in the integration of the day ahead market between Bulgaria and Greece. And it is pushing now and by the end of this year, we're expecting the integration with the Romanian market and then uh, this will kind of sort out very large part of the European market integration. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm John Fedderson, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora. And the focus of today's show is the energy transition in Southeastern Europe. Uh, to discuss this topic, my guest on the show today is a leading thinker on Southeastern European energy. Uh, and he's not just me saying this, Euractiv has twice voted him one of the most influential voices in EU energy. Among many roles, he's a fellow of the European Climate Foundation, He's chair of the Brussels-based Building Performance Institute. Uh, he was quite briefly Bulgarian environment minister in a caretaker government uh, in 2013. He's been active in academia, uh, chair of the Bulgarian School of Politics, board member of the American University of Bulgaria, and he is a published fiction author. My guest on the show today is Julian Popov. Uh, welcome, Julian. Thank you, John. Well, brilliant to have you on the show today. Uh, I'd like to start with your journey. Uh, for, for those, you know, for those who were tuned in during the introduction, they know you've you've had a varied uh, and very interesting professional life. Um, one thing that interests me is you wrote a novel, and it's called Islands of Mist. What's what's Islands of Mist about? Huh. Well, it's it's uh, about the. Um... Bulgarian provincial accountant who arrives in England and uh, gets everything wrong and goes through all the level of um, uh, the strange English uh, society and social circles. So uh, it, it is a um, light-hearted satire about um, England, actually. I always have to explain that it's not autobiographical. I was going to ask, is, it, this, is there any autobiography? Bit, uh, <laughs> I'm not an accountant, and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, but it was very funny that uh, a few months after I published it in Bulgaria, there was an accountant with exactly the same name as the main character who contacted me and said, well, I work in a bank in Bulgaria, and it is my story. <laughs> <laughs> and you've ruined my life. Yeah. Uh, okay, interesting. Okay, well, th there you go. So, Islands of Mist, if, you, if you're interested. And, in and the idea of Islands of, of Mist is that uh, England is always misunderstood outside England, but English people don't mind that and don't dispel the, the misunderstanding. And one of the things is that everybody thinks that England is covered in mist all the time. And um, the character soon realizes that basically there are no mists in the islands of mist. So something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, I can, I can, I can agree with that as a foreigner now in the UK. Now, you're, of course, London-based now, uh, Julian, uh, but you seem to me to be very much a citizen of Europe. You're engaged with policy debates at the European Commission. You're active in a number of markets across the whole breadth of the, of the union. Uh, does Brexit make you reconsider living in London? No. Uh, Brexit was a very unfortunate event, uh, and, but it happened. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, UK and Europe are uh, completely disconnected. 
I would even say that I refuse to accept Brexit, and especially in climate and energy world, uh, UK and Europe work very, very closely together. And in many other ways, the links are so deep and historically and, and culturally defined that uh, it is uh, not something that would force me or many other uh, people to, to make such life-changing decisions. Mm. Do you think the UK will be back in the European Union, say, three decades from now? I suppose so, uh, because I think at the moment of Brexit, at the moment Brexit was uh, sort of happened, uh, the process of reintegration started on many different levels. Uh, trade agreements, energy trading, uh, um, science, uh, research and development, uh, cooperation, and so on. So everybody is finding a way to compensate what uh, Brexit has done. And I think this process will continue. And I will not be surprised if uh, in not three, but uh, 10 or 15 years, uh, it rejoins the European Union. Clearly, the European Union will need to also some changes, but that's happening all the time. Yeah, interesting. So perhaps it's the shock that, that both both sides needed in a in a sense. Um, so final question on your on your journey to where you are now. So you were the Bulgarian Environment Minister. You're in a caretaker government. It was a relatively short period of time. Did you? And I've always you know I asked this question recently of Guy Newey, who is a political staffer, about the impact of the minister on the world you know is it is it the minister that can change the course of history or is it you know within the context of a system there's relatively little that you can do so in that short period of time did you did you feel like you achieved which must have been only a, a, a few months did you feel like you achieved much well it's uh, power is very interesting thing at the moment you're put in position of power and and that changes your mind transforms you and deforms you and you start believing that the world depends on you so uh, it was quite a fight for me to uh, not to accept that illusion so clearly for a short uh, period of time uh, it is difficult to achieve something that uh, is uh, visible and long lasting but it was also a beginning of a, of a policy engagement journey, a new type of policy engagement journey, uh, in which I think gradually, uh, I, I would like to believe that I had some impact. Um, uh, following my ministerial position, I was also uh, energy security advisor to the Bulgarian president, then I was uh, goodwill ambassador for Bulgarian energy policy. And one of the missions that I've always had, or at least in the last 10, 12 years, was to put Southeast Europe, uh, to change the perception about Southeast Europe as uh, being the Southern Gas Corridor, and that's it. Uh, Southeast Europe is an area with enormous uh, renewable potential, including hydro and, and solar and wind and everything. Uh, it is also a land with uh, fantastic uh, entrepreneurial potential in digitalization, the digital sector, and, and so on. So all that was somehow not recognized before. And uh, we helped setting up the, the Central and East European and Southeast European uh, Connectivity Ministerial Group which expanded to the Western Balkans and Ukraine and, and Greece. It includes now 17 countries. Uh, I believe this act and several others um, uh, developments that I have been uh, involved and had some modest uh, uh, impact on uh, had a, a, a great effect on the changing of the perception of Southeast Europe. And I believe now People, companies, governments, the European Commission uh, see Southeast Europe as uh, at least as a land of uh, great potential for clean energy. Mm, interesting. And it'd be good to pick up on that. So 
We see, Aurora sees, I think, quite a lot of activity in Southeast Europe around the power sector. And, and it, exactly as you describe, it's no, it's no longer just about uh, gas, gas corridors, alternative sources of gas into Europe, then through the Ukraine and, the, and, um, and Nord Stream. And rather, it's about you know, potential for, for power generation and those types of things. So the, the, to me, at least, the canonical story is something along the lines of, you know, renewables investors, they see that there's huge competition in Western Europe to develop um, assets. You know, there's auctions for offshore wind capacity, for onshore wind, for solar, hugely competitive, largely de-risk, very mature. And so if you want a higher return, you need to look, if you're clever and you want a higher return, you want to look elsewhere. And, and people take different paths. Some say, right, we want to take on more development risk and, and, and not just own the assets, but develop them. Some say we want to look at new technologies like hydrogen. And some say we want to look at perhaps less mature markets where the rules are still being defined. Uh, and at least in Europe, Southeast Europe seems like one of those as a, as a consequence. We had um, Harry Boyd Carpenter from the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development on the podcast uh, a month or two ago uh, talking about that. Are you, are you seeing more interest in Bulgaria in particular, and I suppose Romania, Greece, over the last year or two in terms of the power investment landscape? Well, certainly there is a very strong movement pushed by the... Um, uh, COVID recovery packages and the Green Deal, which in a very interesting way sort of merged with each other and created sort of a public uh, perfect storm, uh, which is, however, public storm of uh, uh, public funding, expected public funding and uh, uh, promised policies and climate targets. Uh, to what extent uh, private uh, finance will uh, follow that trend is uh, still under a question mark because um, Southeast Europe is uh, quite a chaotic place. Uh, it, uh, Bulgaria, Romania, Bulgaria specifically doesn't have this uh, clear vision and direction. Uh, the government doesn't... Uh, uh, endorse um, an ambitious uh, renewables plan, but this is changing. So a uh, very interesting role in this uh, process is playing Greece, which uh, with its commitment of closing down coal by 2028, uh, which might happen even earlier, send a very, very strong signal that uh, actually renewables and uh, uh, coal phase out uh, could uh, move very fast in the region. Uh, there is also the very low cost of renewables is pushing a lot of uh, fragmented investments here and there. Um, a lot of solar installations for self-consumption, but also some suggestions and investment proposal for fairly large solar industrial parks like uh, Eneri, for instance, which uh, um, uh, suggested and, and made an investment proposal for 400 megawatts uh, uh, solar park in Bulgaria. So uh, we, we, we see interesting signals. Uh, one of them recently was the move of the Three Seas Initiative Fund run by Amber, which took a substantial share in Eneri on the basis of their pipeline of two gigawatt of solar, in, mainly in, in Southeast Europe. So uh, we see that commercial uh, funds are also working in, but also the companies that are investing. And I think that will accelerate. We just need few strong commitments by governments, not so much about financial support and subsidies, but about not messing up with this trend, uh, as it happened in 2012, when there was a solar boom in the, in the region, and then uh, Bulgaria and Romania also introduced retroactive uh, legislation 
which damaged the investor confidence very, very seriously. Um, now, I think it's easier simply because the, um, uh, the cost of renewables is very low. Markets are also uh, getting more and more integrated. Uh, so we will see the investors' interests uh, growing beyond what I just mentioned. Interesting. Yeah, and we, we're seeing, for example, Spain at the moment who are saying, you know, the European carbon price has risen sufficiently quickly to the point that renewables investors are getting windfall gains from the power market and thinking about retroactively you know, yes, that, that, that has a, a very strong effect, again, very strong signal. Um, mm. Then we have um, uh, interest in, in slightly longer term investments like the offshore wind. So, for example, Romania passed a special act on offshore wind. Uh, uh, the Romanian Hydroelectric uh, uh, made a statement that they would like to built probably about 600 uh, megawatt offshore wind uh, that uh, attracted interest by other investors. There is a lot of discussions both in Bulgaria and Romania about offshore wind, but this is clearly not something that will happen in the next year or two. Uh, but uh, the interest there is, is growing. And again, in Romania, it is strongly supported by the government and the, and the uh, parliamentary act in Bulgaria. It's not supported by the government explicitly, but uh, the the interest is already there. It's it, you've raised a few interesting points there around public opinion to an extent and politics. You know, for me, one of the big drivers of offshore wind has been nimbyism and the desire to get turbines away from the the landscape and into the into the sea. And obviously, you've talked about Greece as a, as a movement. You know, as a as a government that that sees sees political benefit in decarbonisation, when you look at Bulgaria or perhaps some of the neighbouring countries, what is it? Is, you know, how strong is the decarbonisation movement? You know, is when you talk, you know, when you talk to politicians about motives for wanting to go green, is there decarbonisation? Is it energy independence from you know from from Russia and other regions? Is it you know it, What's the what are the drivers of renewables policy in Southeast Europe as as you see them? Does NIMBYism play a role, and is that stifling the development of of onshore wind? Yes, I mean NIMBYism will play a role when uh, specific projects for offshore wind are proposed. When pictures appeared and already in public discussions and public perception discussions, the the argument uh, is that not going to ruin our uh, tourist business is appearing. Also, there are the discussions about offshore wind uh, uh, of the coast of Croatia. This uh, is also discussed in, from point of view of tourism and the beauty of the uh, of the area. Um, the driver in in Southeast Europe for decarbonization is certainly not climate concern, which is mm -hmm. odd since Southeast Europe is. Uh, um, a region that uh, is already affected and is predicted to be seriously affected by uh, climate change. The, 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 the fires uh, in uh, the forest fires in, in Greece and in Bulgaria too um, are growing and, and a serious problem, but that somehow doesn't translate into decarbonization policies. What drives them usually? Yes, energy independence or energy security is driver in some cases. So certainly in Turkey is. Turkey has very strong uh, renewable policy, um, also offshore wind strategy, which appeared uh, before the European uh, Union pushed the whole offshore wind agenda. Uh, so the 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 drive to reduce dependency on Russian gas is, is very strong in the drive for renewables in, um, in Turkey. Uh, also in, in Ukraine, for instance, uh, certainly in the Baltic states, uh, uh, not so much in uh, Bulgaria and uh, Romania. 
the European policies, the targets seems to be a stronger driver, but now I think the low cost of renewables and the high uh, price of carbon yeah. are very, very strong uh, signals. And also seeing what is happening around when an investor or energy professional in Bulgaria looks at the targets of Greece, or when in on 2017, uh, Siemens Gamesa uh, won a project for one gigawatt uh, uh, wind in uh, Turkey at the price of 30 euros per megawatt hour, uh, that was also a very strong signal that something is happening in the region. So mm -hmm. that kind of watching the neighbor has a strong impact. Strong impact in Bulgaria has the progress of Northern Macedonia, for instance, with uh, the tenders for um, uh, solar. Uh, suddenly Macedonia, Northern Macedonia moved forward and uh, we always tend to be very jealous if something happens there and it's not happening in Bulgaria. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I'd be shocked. And I think Aurora's view is, you know, I'd be shocked if the economics, particularly of solar generation, didn't stack up very well in that part of the world you know, on the basis of you know, power, you know the, the value of the power they can displace in the system, basically. I suppose it comes down to that question of how do you price in political risk um, and, and, okay, you can have a... You know the cash flows look good until until um, until the, the rules of the game change. In which case you might you might struggle a bit. But uh, certainly the fundamentals seem yes, very absolutely. good. For, for and most. and the region has also this fantastic uh, asset of uh, lots of lignite mines, which offer huge areas of land owned by a single owner uh, with the strongest possible grid. Yeah. These are areas which could generate a huge interest for industrial solar. And once industrial solar is, is starts, that could attract also the, the, the green hydrogen investments, uh, clearly with uh, help of public funds, but the public funds now are abundant. Yeah, interesting. Do you, just zeroing in a little bit more on Europe's role in Southeastern Europe. So... Uh, so it feels to me at least as though the European Commission has been a force for harmonization in electricity markets. You know, the, the, grids, the grid is largely synchronized to a much larger extent than, say, across the United States. Products are well-defined, they're traded, uh, you know, the, there are balancing markets, there are ancillary markets, so there are capacity markets. And, and, you know, they've all, a lot of them have gone through, you know, European DG comp processes and they all look somewhat consistent with each other. Do you get the sense in Bulgaria and the region that the European Commission has been a force for good in terms of power market governance, power market structure, the rules of the games and those types of things? Yes, definitely. The push from the European Commission for uh, market integration across uh, the border uh, has uh, produced very good results actually in Bulgaria, first with the establishment of the um, uh, National um, Independent Energy Exchange, which is now part of the Bulgarian Stock Exchange. And uh, in turn, the independent power exchange played an uh, instrumental role in the integration of the day-ahead market between Bulgaria and Greece. And it is pushing now. And by the end of this year, uh, we're expecting the integration with the Romanian market. And then uh, this will kind of sort out very large part of, of the European market integration. Uh, they're not formal, but behind the scenes uh, discussions with, uh, uh, for integration with Turkey. Very interesting uh, discussion would be uh, how the uh, Ukrainian market could be integrated also and to what extent and this is also a process that is going on so yes definitely the the, the European Commission is a massive force for good 
uh, in that and in many other energy cases. So, for example, um, nobody managed to stop Turkish Stream, for instance, or Nord Stream, but uh, the European Commission, through DG competition, managed to force Gazprom to sell uh, gas at um, market prices in, in areas where uh, there is no real market. So that, that, that was quite, a, uh, quite, quite an achievement and, and many other uh, things uh, that, that have been achieved in the sector are a result of strong pressure from the Commission. Mm -hmm. Julian, on the question of political risk, one thing on my mind relates to the big oil and gas companies, the shells, the BPs, the totals of this world. So, you know, arguably, these, these were still are some of the largest companies in the world. And, and the argument behind some of that scale was around, you know, logistics and, and, and oil is a global business. But part of it was around risk diversification. You know, if you're going to drill offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, which in some ways is risky, having some you know, having some production in Nigeria is good, maybe a bit in Russia. And you can, by being sufficiently large, you can spread your geopolitical risk. Um, it, it seems like for someone who's concerned about political risk in Southeastern Europe, uh, the big oil and gas companies, and, you know, would be natural participants in the power sector in these markets, you know, notwithstanding also the fact that, uh, they've been active in the region. A lot of these big companies have been active in the region for a reasonably long period of time. And yet I don't see them. I see BP chasing very low cost of capital offshore wind assets in the North Sea, uh, competing furiously for them. Uh, and I actually see the infrastructure funds, the guys who are meant to be the low, the low risk takers, active and searching for opportunity and for yield in Southeast Europe. Why aren't the or are the big oil and gas companies in Southeast Europe? You mentioned NL, you didn't mention NE. Uh, you know, why don't you think they're there? Uh, and is there a role for them? Well, uh, some of them are there because they they were expecting to um, discover um, nat natural gas in the Black Sea, for instance. Yeah. But um, uh, that. Uh, uh, seems to to be happening uh, in Turkey, uh, not through the companies that you mentioned, but uh, Turkish companies, uh, but not so much uh, of the shore of Bulgaria and Romania. Uh, so uh, their operations, I think, are relatively limited, and. Uh, it, it is a very interesting question whether they will start using their position and their just physical presence in Southeast Europe to start looking more ambitiously to uh, renewables. They're well positioned to, uh, to, to look into offshore wind, for instance, with all their expertise with offshore drilling. Uh, they're well positioned to, in their retail mar market, for instance, Shell, which has lots of uh, um, um, petrol power stations, uh, petrol stations around the region, and OMV and, and others to look at uh, uh, electric car infrastructure. Uh, we see some initial signals, but they seem to be quite uh, cautious. I think one of the issues is that the size of, of potential deals is uh, not large yeah. enough for them to uh, take the plunge. Yeah, and that doesn't surprise me. And it, and it seems like, to some extent, given the scale of the ambition of the targets these companies have committed to, I, can't, I don't know what it is, but it's you know dozens of gigawatts for BP by you know within a decade or two. Th those types of metrics. It's very hard to get there if you're not buying gigawatt to gigawatt offshore wind farms. So there's a there's a there's a scale. Yes, I mean one one opportunity would be if uh, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania, and Ukraine team up together for uh, a common um, offshore wind project. Yeah, a leasing or round or something. number of projects, some kind of a mini North Sea case. Um, then uh, this type of companies will will wake up because there will be something for them to, to look at. 
that um, small projects in with the political uncertainty uh, is probably not enough to to involve them. Mm-hmm. Just one final question, uh, Ju- Julian, before I move to wrap it up. There's been an ongoing discussion on this podcast around why the British housing stock is so poorly insulated. Uh, most recently talked to Guy Newey at the Energy Systems Catapult, who's focusing on this. Uh, it's not the case everywhere. Uh, you know, I often quote Angela Merkel as, as saying, you know, the thing she thinks that's most German is a well-made window. Uh, why is the why is why is the British housing stock so poorly insulated? Do you think, as the, you know, with your hat on as the chairman of the Building Performance Institute? Um, one reason is that uh, buildings uh, that there is a very large building stock in uh, England and UK, uh, which is quite old, and. Uh, And it is not that type of old that you will pull it down. I mean, many, many hundreds of, uh, I think, uh, 500,000 houses, if I'm not uh, mistaken, are in various categories of listed buildings. So they are protected against uh, uh, alternations and and changes. So it's difficult to take a Georgian house and insulate it. It's, It's almost impossible. You have to put internal wall insulation, which is not damaging the style in any way. Uh, It is not possible to change the windows, for instance. Uh, And uh, certainly Britain will not accept for its Georgian houses, German windows. So uh, that's one reason. The other reason, obviously, because of very long period of, of building and, and building up the, the, the housing stock, there are many different building standards and, and types of buildings in, in, in England. The other thing is that England is very much uh, uh, houses rather than uh, blocks of flat environment. So it's uh, difficult to develop uh, a retrofitting program that would uh, work on uh, hundreds of thousands of, of blocks of flats, like, for instance, in Eastern Europe, such approach would be uh, m- much easier. But I have to say that new houses are being built uh, according to the European uh, near zero energy building standard or, or very close standard to that. Uh, these are buildings that are very well insulated. Uh, probably the best German uh, passive houses would beat the best English uh, uh, near zero near zero energy building house, but uh, the competition would be quite close. So that's changing, mm-hmm. but the existing building stock uh, is, is a burden for fast transformation. Okay. So the po- positive note as the as the housing stock turns over, it's just it doesn't as it, you know it doesn't turn over particularly quickly. Um, excellent. So so before I conclude, I'd like to present you with a few concepts, Julian, in the energy transition, and ask you if you think they're overrated or underrated. So the first concept is the credibility of Europe's climate targets. Now Europe has recently uh, committed to a fifty five percent reduction. Uh, on 1990 levels by 2030. Do you think the credibility of this target in Europe is overrated or underrated? Um, I think the perception of the the new targets is seen with very high level of confidence that they will be met. So they're Mm -hmm. not overrated, they're not underrated, they're seen with with a very high level of seriousness. And the reason for that is that uh, the previous targets for 2020 and the uh, notion for coal phase out was seen by many politicians as something that we we might not do it because we don't want to do it or we're too dependent on coal. But we saw what happened with with coal. And, And the total destruction of the coal industry, partly as a result of targets, partly as a result of of low 
um, cost of renewables is a cautionary tale for any uh, European targets which are now seen in a much, much more serious and responsible way than before. Yeah, certainly. If you bet against European climate credibility over the last ten or twenty years, you didn't do. You probably didn't do very well in your investments. I you suspect. lose. You um, lose a lot of money. You would have lost a lot of money if you. And if you bet on on the credibility of the targets, you would have made a lot of money. So, um, and, and I think you. It's a good point, Julian. It's sort of. It feels like the credibility is very i mean all you have to do is look at a 60 euro carbon price and yeah. say there is a very wide belief in the market that europe will hit this target or come very close or exceed it or something like that um okay the second concept uh europe's ability to influence global climate policy we've just had the g7 in uh in in the uk um, do you think Europe's ability to influence global climate policy is overrated or underrated? And I should say by a European, you know, by an educated European energy professional. It's definitely underrated because you can, if you take 100 statements about European uh, role in climate, 99 of them will be, oh, we're emitting just, seven, eight or nine or 10 percent of emissions. So if we reduce a little bit, that will not make any change. Uh, that's utter nonsense. Um, the European Union is the biggest trading bloc around the world. Um, supply chains are uh, all over the world. And when you introduce a target uh, in Europe, that affects the whole supply chain. Uh, and this is uh, this applies to individual companies or countries. Uh, when uh, Volkswagen or some other company says we want to build zero carbon cars, that means that every single component, whether it's produced in China or India or Serbia or Africa, will have to be produced with zero carbon uh, um, process. So that has massive impact. But the other uh, thing that surprises many is the impact of the carbon adjustment um, uh, border uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism CBA. Uh, we still don't know what exactly that will be, but it already scared um, countries and governments around the world. Uh, Russia, which is so reluctant to uh, reactions for to any uh, uh, climate policy in Europe is talking very seriously about uh, uh, developing their own carbon markets, uh, becoming uh, leading exporter of green hydrogen and many, many other things, Turkey and other countries. So the impact is, is enormous. And this is just an announcement and, uh, uh, and a draft proposal. So that that gives a very yeah. interesting. Um, I, and and uh, Ju Julian, I totally agree. I speak to a number of people who are, you know, producing, you know, energy intensive producers around the world, and they and they've seen this uh, this border adjustment mechanism proposed by the European Commission, and they say, are the Europeans serious about this? Because this will have a material impact on my business so people are taking it seriously and i think they're adapting their commercial decisions uh, to the threat of a border adjustment tax in europe which is a massive change from the past you know for 15 maybe even 20 years the story was always uh okay yeah we could do a border adjustment uh we could threaten people who want to export uh carbon intensive goods into the eu but it'd be complicated you know under the wto rules maybe it risks retaliatory action uh and so why would we bother blowing up global trade just for the environment uh now or maybe it's too complicated and how do we calculate embodied emissions in particular goods but european europe's now taking it seriously uh people in around the world seem to think it's credible so i, I entirely agree with you on that julian um Good. Third concept, the value of energy independence from Russia in Southeast Europe. Uh, you said it's a big political motivator. Do you think the value of it, though, is, is overrated or underrated? Um, it, it's, 
I think it's overrated because uh, what we need is stable market, uh, clear decarbonization paths, and variety of energy solutions. And, and we are on this path. And the dependency of Russia on gas import, export, uh, is becoming more and more critical than dependency of Southeast Europe on gas import. Yeah. So um, we will never have the, 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 the gas tap uh, turned off from, from Russia and uh, gas consumption will decline and uh, gas sources are many, infrastructure is abundant so uh, this I wouldn't put into a problem at, at all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, LNG import terminals at whatever, 25% utilisation. It's, it's not as if Europe is short Absolutely. on diversification options. Um, uh, very interesting. Great. And I, I, find, I find myself agreeing with, with much of what you say, Julian. Um, so excellent. That's probably a natural note to finish on. Um, Really delighted to have you in to share your perspective on a, a part of Europe that I think will feature increasingly prominently in uh, in in investment in the power sector and and in its role in decarbonisation. So, uh, Julian Popov, thank you so much for taking the time to speak. Well, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure for me to have this uh, talk with you, John. That was John Federson, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora, speaking to Julian Popov fellow of the European Climate Foundation and former Minister of Environment of Bulgaria. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.